Good morning, all. Great to be here and great to be able to kick start uh, what's going to be a bit of a journey in terms of long term plan amendment. So, uh, the team with me today is uh, Carolyn, or we call her Caro, and uh, Jenna. So, they're both part of the strategic planning team and uh, basically the leads on the, the long term plan and plan processes. So, uh, they'll be doing a lot of the talking today. Um, I'll chip in with a few bits here and there. Uh, what I would say is um, I've fed back a little bit of um, some of the comments from the time at Aruti last week, uh, particularly around sort of uh, I think the feedback was treating people as though you don't know much at this point or anything. Um, so apologies, some of we're conscious that we've got people who are very experienced being around several LTP cycles and we've got others that will be their, their first one. So today is going to be, I guess, finding our way. Um, we will be using today as a bit of a gauge to work out where are the bits that we can go faster on, where are the bits we might need to slow down and take a bit more time on or we'll come back with more information. Uh, but today is very much around a foundation, uh, setting the foundation for obviously future future briefings. As you'll hear, there's, there's quite a bit that we do actually need to do uh, between now and Christmas, and, and ultimately that's driven by the fact that to do an LTP amendment and to uh, adopt it in time, it is one of those things that does have some statutory timeframes attached to it. So it's not a project we just simply slide out a few months and sort of catch up and things. We are actually set by time frame to, to adopt, and that, that triggers uh, the process from here through to essentially the end of next June. So I'll hand over to, to Caro and we'll start getting into it. Thank you, David. Whatever. Good morning, everybody. Um, so this morning, the first of our five uh, long-term plan uh, amendment workshops, um, We, the purpose of today is to provide an overview of our key strategic documents, so the Horror Whenua 2040 blueprint, long-term plans in general, annual plans in general, and to answer and then to move into the long-term plan amendment itself to talk about the scope and the process and to answer any questions that you might have about any of those parts. So yes, it's the first of uh, five LTP amendment workshops that we'll have before Christmas focusing on different parts, which we'll talk in more detail about later. This leads up to a direction that we will seek from you before Christmas um, about the direction that we are heading so that over the rest of December and January, uh, we can prepare the draft consultation material for you to have for you uh, by the start of February. So we move into the Horror Fenora 2040 blueprint. So probably what I should start with saying is we uh, got an allocated amount of time here. We've tried to build a presentation which has left a bit of flexibility in it and quite happy to take questions as we go through. So, or if your style is to note down questions and you want to catch one of us sort of in a break or afterwards or later on, that's fine as well. But uh, we certainly have left time and, and rather than get to 20 slides later and realise actually it might have been helpful to have known that, but they're happy to see you like go on and we'll, we'll sort of pause at a convenient time. So we'll start with the Horror of 2040 blueprint. Um, the reason why we're starting there is we see that as the, the umbrella document, if you like, and you'll see a diagram in a moment which just explains it's sort of placed in the hierarchy of, of, of other council documents. And essentially, it's a we've described it as an implementation strategy. You'll see the, the cover of it there on the screen. It was adopted by the last council in May 22 and was developed over largely 2021 and uh, adjusted a bit in 2022 before it was adopted. And what that, what that blueprint sought to do is essentially, we were at a stage where the council had done quite a lot of strategic documents. We'd done a town centre strategy, we'd done an integrated transport strategy, we had a growth strategy, there were a range of other strategies and action plans, but there wasn't a whole lot of implementation of those. And so they're all sitting there, almost at the start line, sort of nudging for pole position as to what went first and what should, did something need to happen before the other thing or which action was, perhaps uh, more important. And so in recognition of that, we saw the blueprint as a way of pulling together those documents and, and creating a strategic framework which started to make sense of the, the different strategies and the actions that fell out of those. 
with the, the upshot being a, a blueprint and it sort of tells a bit of a story as you go through but it ends with 12 action areas and, and each action area has a, a few uh, action items underneath it and what it sought to do is, is essentially look at and identify a strategic sequence where it actually said well okay doing this strategy or implementing this action here first then unlocks the ability for this action and, and so on and so that as you'll see uh, was adopted after the long-term plan that we have at the moment the 2021 to 41 long-term plan but it was being developed at a similar time frame so I do want to give you some comfort that one of the things we did with the previous council was at that time before adopting the LTP was to do that check in terms of was there alignment where projects and, and the direction of things um, within the LTP even though the, the blueprint hadn't um, been able to be adopted and, and didn't sit as that sort of foundation document at that point in time. So going forward I guess what we have identified is um, and there's a bit of a conversation on this last week. Um, it sits there. There are some projects that were a long running projects, I guess, things like district plan changes, where we're implementing the, the growth strategy, things like the town centre. They sit there, and, and through the LTP, uh, there was budget allocated to those. But there's other things within the blueprint itself, other actions that, that aren't currently budget, budgeted. And that's where, in time, um, and we're not going to try to be. Our advice is to not squeeze it in between now and Christmas. It's a sort of a, a New Year conversation um, where we will be wanting to test, I guess, the direction that was in the blueprint with the, the new council and also start to have that conversation around what are those, what do you want to prioritise out of that and ultimately what do you want to fund out of that. Because within the blueprint, there's a range of roles that council can play and the blueprint does identify those and that might range from being a facilitator to being a funder to being an enabler. Um, working in partnership and, and the like. So we want to test that with the new council, get that, with the view being that that would be what goes into the LTP proper. Um, but there will be a short conversation at some point around just any expectations you have of implementing the blueprint in the upcoming financial year as well. So just moving to... Um, so in terms of, if you can, picture a... A diagram and I think has been included in, in um, the earlier document. At the top, Hrofner Blueprint uh, sits alongside LTP and then beneath that you can imagine a suite of strategic documents, whether they be strategies, policies, action plans, and that's basically they've been ones that have been pre-developed, I guess, before the blueprint have been sucked up into the blueprint and we've sort of looked at basically took over the whole wall on the side here, captured every action out of those different strategies and action plans and then start to look at, well, how do these join? Where are the dependencies? What one perhaps needs to go before the other? And that's the work that's reflected in, in the blueprint. So the purpose of today is not to go into the detail of the blueprint. Um, we'll save that for a, a detailed workshop. But wanted to start there because it is um, does sit at that, that top of that hierarchy. And is obviously going to, where we get to talk about LTP proper, become a key part of that will, we would expect an alignment between the LTP, what's in the LTP proper, and obviously the, the blueprint. Thank you. And so then we move from the, the top layer of the blueprint and we step down into the long-term plans. And they are one of uh, Council's uh, key strategic documents. They set out uh, the direction that we want to go, the outcomes that Council wants to achieve, and also the funding for that. So we do them every three years, and the Local Government Act says that they must cover a minimum of 10 years. Our current one is 20 years uh, to give us uh, greater alignment to the work that needs to be done. And uh, the full LTP is an 18-month process. Uh, so as David mentioned, we'll be starting on that next year uh, for it to come to you for adoption uh, before the end of June in 2024. So uh, there's a lot in the local government, uh, in the long-term plan that is uh, set out as requirements by the Local Government Act. So it describes all of the activities of council those community outcomes that we want to achieve, gives the long-term focus, and it provides a basis for accountability. It includes a whole lot of measures that we need to report against um, to show how we're progressing. 
and it's um, a big piece of work that has a large impact on the community, so we have to use the special consultative process. So that's the, the big form of uh, consultation. Formal consultation documents, uh, specified periods that we go out for, and then we have oral submissions as well. So, the nuts and bolts. And then how it's put together. So this is a real team effort. It's really collaborative um, and it involves elected members very closely um, and with discussions with us about scope, the approach, parameters and goals. Discussions also with the community because this is about the future of the district and where we head it. We look at budgets, um, how we have been tracking, where we currently sit and then where we'd like to get to um, and options for that. Um, a whole lot of assumptions, so just uh, quickly on to the next slide. You don't have to read this, but we try and pull as much information out to gather a picture of where we're heading so that we can base um, the direction that we're heading on what we know may or is likely to happen. Extensive engagement and consultation with the community. So while there's uh, formal consultation, we always um, engage early and have early discussions with the community as well about uh, outcomes, um, to let them know what's happening um, and when and how they can be involved as well. And then um, coming down to the bottom of the slide and the final part in the process is uh, where elected members make decisions on what what forms part of the formal LTP and the direction that we are going. So yes, the list. Um, this is actually in the LTP document itself uh, with a whole lot of useful information, but it's just there to show you. This here is um, the contents of it. Um, and again, not to read the detail, but to note the extent of the work that goes in and also the, um, the size of it. It's over 500 pages. And it's comprised of activity statements, which um, focus on all of the areas that council works across, provides an infrastructure strategy and financial strategy, um, a whole lot of policies. Jen is going to step you through some of these um, in just a moment. Um, our forecasting assumptions, how we work with um, development of money capacity to contribute to decision making, and down there at the bottom is the independent auditor's report. Um, so we have to have this audited at two points before we go out for consultation and then ahead of the document being audited. And so those are um, two really key timeframes that really um, set markers for how we plan and time the rest of our work because they're a little bit beyond our control for when it fits in. So, I'll pass you over to Jenna um, to step you through the different uh, pieces in the long-term plan. So I'll just run through the, our current long-term plan as it is today, which will help you see what parts are in here and how they all fit together and how all the work we're doing over the next little while um, all connects together. So we'll start with our community outcomes. So usually in doing a full LTP, one of the first steps is, is for council to agree on the community outcomes. So we do this in partnership with the community as well. So that will be a big part of consultation when we come to the full LTP. So everything that we as a council do comes back to working towards improving one of these community outcomes. As you can see, our current ones are vibrant economy, outstanding environment, fit for purpose infrastructure, partnership with Hunger to Whenua, and strong communities. So these were consulted on and decided through the last LTP. Um, these currently aren't in scope of our amendments, so we'll, we'll review them next time. Coming to the first big part of the long-term plan is the activity statements. So we've got an activity statement for each group of activities that council undertakes. So you'll find that everything that we do is represented under one of these. 
So I'll just run you through what is involved. So uh, with your solid waste as an example, just so I'll run through what is actually involved in each. So we have to start by listing out what is actually included within this activity. Then we go through to how long is what we do changed since our long-term plan. And depending on the activity, that might be a lot of change or it might be little. Um, then we have to recognise the challenges that we face. So what assumptions are we making um, about how, what might come up in the next sort of three years? Um, the, we have to recognise the significant negative effects. So in that we consider the social, cultural, economic and environmental well-being of the community. And then finally, the last group up there are the key risks and assumptions. So that's anything that we might know or that could come up or anything that will come up over the next few years that could have an effect on how we deliver this activity. Um, as you can see here, I'll just run through this quickly. We list each project that will be coming up and the amount of expenditure that comes with that project for each financial year. Then we've got the rationale. Why do we actually do this activity? So we show how each activity council undertakes improves at least one of the identified community outcomes and how council actually contributes to this activity. As you can see there, we've got examples of provider or an advocate. So these are quite common ones through the LTP. You'll also find sometimes that we are also the funder and the regulator. So each role has a different level of commitment from us. Um, yeah, so this is how we measure our performance for each activity. So we've listed out the services that fall under the activity, the community outcome that relates to it and how we're actually gonna measure. And again, each year has its own different target. And this is just how we can make sure that we are delivering on what we have promised for the community and ensuring our services, um, we're doing the best that we can there. Um, we aren't currently planning on reviewing these targets, but that will definitely be a consideration through the full LTP. Um, I'll quickly just mention the infrastructure strategy and financial strategy. Sorry. Can I, can I just check in just that last comment about the um the, the comment about the we won't review these targets, but where, for example, in the case of solid waste, if that forms part of the LTP amendment, then presumably that is up for discussion and the review. Is that correct? Okay. <laughs> And I assume that then we receive some form of reporting around how we're doing against these targets from a monitoring perspective. You do. Um, I didn't mention that, but the, after we've done the LTP at the end of each financial year, we do the annual report as well, and you'll get um, regular updates. <laughs> yes, so, so maybe just to add to that. So in your agenda for the 23rd of council meeting will be a new what we're calling the organisation performance report and um, the organisation performance report will on a bi-monthly basis report through to the council how we're tracking against those SSPs um, but what you'll learn over time is the SSPs aren't always helpful in telling the story about what we do and so that's why we're trying to build a more kind of holistic organisation reporting template that actually can tell the story. So just for clarification on that, Monique, the, the long-term plan monitoring report that did exist, will that still, that will form part of what you're talking about or not? No, so the monitoring report will still exist in its current state and that will still come through to council. Um, and so just for new elected members, we have two types of monitoring reports. We have a normal council resolution monitoring report and then we have a long-term plan resolution monitoring report. And they're essentially the decisions that council have made and it's, it's a traffic light report. We tell you whether we're on track, off track or whether we've completed something. So that's excluded from the organisation performance report. 
So an example there would be through the long-term plan, the decision might have been that a request came in for some funding and the decision was not to put the funding in the LTP, but that officers would meet with that community group and, and so that would be an action that then gets tracked through the long-term monitoring report and at a point in time over that cycle officers would be working towards that and at some point there'd be a report that says that task has been completed and, and drops off. So that's how we track the, the actions or those decisions and then this process, um, or what's just been described, will be how the specific targets that are set up for each activity uh, are monitored and tracked over time as well. We've also got the infrastructure strategy and financial strategy. I won't run through these with you today as you'll have a workshop coming up soon that will go into detail of these parts. Um, policies again, you'll have another workshop coming up on the 23rd that will delve deeper into these. Um, so the financial statements. Uh, also included in here um, and again you'll get some further information as we have. The significant forecasting assumptions was that big list of 28 different assumptions that Kara showed you at the start so all of these um, just go towards um, it's just evidence for what we are actually planning to do and why we're planning on doing it when. Probably just a comment on those is, we'll just have that, yeah. So that's what's in the assumptions that were based, um, that informed, I guess, the current long-term plan. And so with the long-term plan, you're never operating with perfect information. You're operating with the best information available at a point in time. So you'll read on top of the list, or near the top there, number 16. Otaki to North Loveland Expressway. At the time the long-term plan was being adopted, we had to make some assumptions around what we knew was happening at that point in time and how that has then influenced and informed what we have done throughout the long-term plan. Similarly, there was one around there around the landfill, but also you get into things like um, interest rates and things like that. So it's based at a point in time, what's the best information you have? And what the auditors are looking to check is that, is there a consistency between what's in your plan and your assumption and, and do the two sort of stack up and make sense. So next time we do a long-term plan proper, there might be some of those things which might not be on their list. There might be some new things that we need to include because it's a critical assumption that we're using to inform. Um, and obviously there'll be some, some key ones which we'd expect to be there, things like population growth, um, the interest rates inflation and things like that which um, obviously we do become quite important when you start to sort of look at the numbers and, and what drives the activities and, and how we're delivering them. So the next chapter is the development of Māori capacity to contribute to decision making. Um, Kerry will talk to you a bit more about the work that we have started for this chapter but our focus here um, we are looking at making a few small changes now just to make improvements over the time, starting on building trust and building relationships. And then next we've got the council controlled organisations that are listed here. And I'll hand it over to Caro. So just to tie things together there, what Janice just stepped me through is if you were to pick up the, the full hardcover document today and just flick through it, those would be the key sections that you would encounter. Um, or if you're on the online version scrolling through, that is largely what is legislated. So um, yes, sometimes how much we write and, and um, how much detail we go into on some things might differ from council to council, but the long-term plan, the legislation, it actually requires us to have all those those components to it. And um, often it's talked a bit about as a, as a jigsaw that there's these puzzle pieces that all come together to, to form the, the full thing. So we make no apologies for the fact that it sort of ends up being 500 pages. Um, that's something which we have to live with as well. And uh, sometimes the auditors tend to make it end up being a bit longer than we, we perhaps start out by making it as well. But um, And as we'll start to talk in a moment, we've sort of given you the context for the full LTP. Um, we're about to talk shortly about the LTP amendment and, and obviously why we're not looking at every every one of those 500 pages there's you know it's a, a narrow scope that um, we're obviously looking at for this time 
but as I sort of um, tried to excite you last week, um, going through this process is going to uh, prime you for the, uh, the full the full version, which is obviously what we'll be kicking into to next year. Thank you. So we move um, moving from the the long term plan itself, and we're about to drop down into annual plans. So this is the picture of our all local authorities planning cycles. So in the first year, every three years, we do a long-term plan. And in, in the years two and three, we do an annual plan. So for year one, the long-term plan is the annual plan. As mentioned, they cover at least a 10-year period. And what the annual plan is, is an opportunity to check how we are tracking against how we forecast we would be and to see whether any amendments are needed to those forecasts um, to shape the work and the budgets for the year ahead. So um, we end up with a refreshed budget and it also sets out the rates, the key projects and any new spending for the year. So it looks at how we've performed, uh, the package of projects that are in there, and then how we fund that and what the rates number ends up as. So on this, like the long-term plan, we're required to consult, but here, if there are no significant or material differences, so that's the language from the Local Government Act, then we don't have to consult. And we didn't consult on the last one because we followed what was in the long-term plan so there were no key decisions to be made, um, and so that was the reason for that. Which leads us into our current plan. So uh, we're in year two, and we were delivering what was agreed. There was extensive consultation for the long-term plan. We got over 500 submissions that really helped shape the decisions that were made. We didn't consult on it again. And what we learned uh, through going through that, that our council, like um, many or most organisations, was also affected by labour shortages and supply chain issues that arose. The labour shortage was particularly in construction areas and then getting materials. And that meant that we weren't able to deliver all that we had planned in the previous year. So that uh, reduced what we spent. It also reduced what we needed to borrow. And because we borrowed less, there was less interest charged. And so actual rates, because of all of that, ended up being lower than what they were forecast in the long-term plan. Now we come to rates and how we work them out. Uh, I don't mean to do this about morning tea time, but we've got pies. Um, so we have a rates pie, and the pie represents the rates income that is needed for each year. So this pie here represents the rates income that was in the long-term plan year, so year one. This next pie is the rates income that was needed for 2022 and 2023. Now council is the one who can controls the size of the pie. The size of the pie is made up of what we propose to spend money on. So, 7% increase, 7% greater income. So, now, as it's um, sometimes talked about that um, the rates pie means that if we have... Uh, more residents, more ratepayers, then we get more money that we can spend. But the importance of the ratepayers comes when we are dividing up the pie. So we are slicing it up. So that's um, the more ratepayers we have, the smaller the slices. And so more likely it is that smaller the rates increase for people. So that's where the importance of the number of ratepayers comes in. Just to jump in there, you're... See later on two dates. There will be a date in June where we look to adopt the LTP amendment and annual plan, and a date a bit later where we strike the rates. 
and part of the reason for leaving is striking the rates till as late in the financial year as possible, or calendar year, financial year, so it's close to 30th of June, is so that we can um, get as many new properties into the, the rating database and therefore cut the pie just by those few extra slices and hopefully lessen some of that, that rates burden. But um, you probably would have heard it yourselves, you know, people suddenly think all this growth means our council suddenly getting all this extra rates. Um, yeah, the pie doesn't grow when we get more people. It's least we thought of as we could slice it thinner. And then what that looks like is um, with differentials that um, the actual rates that people pay differs depending on where in the district uh, people live and also the type of property that they have. So whether it's rural, lifestyle, it's um, a business. Um, and what you see in that far right corner, the percentage change. So that evens out to an average 7% uh, uh, increase. Now, um, in a future workshop on the 23rd of November, Jacinta is going to be talking um, more about the impact that um, the valuations will have and social step-through impacts that they will have for you. Um, Probably just while that slides on sorry. the screen there, um, just highlighting the point that Kira is making, often there'll be the headline that goes out in the, the media, you know, councils raise rates by... 5%, 6% or whatever, and inevitably we get it, so I'm sure you'll get it as elected members, well, someone contact you and say, well, how come my rates have got my rates, but my rates went up 10% or 15% or 8%. Um, and it is because of those different levels of services that are, are done in the way we currently cal calculate our, our rates. And so that, that list of properties there is something which we've been using those same properties uh, within the district um, for a, quite a period of time now, and so we've been able to see, I guess, the, the, the impact on those same properties over and, and gives us a, a, an apples with apples sort of comparison um, as we look at year on year in terms of that, that rates impact. But uh, as, as mentioned, um, properties in the district have just gone through a revaluation process. We're just receiving that information now. And as part of this long-term plan amendment, we are looking at rating systems. So it will certainly heighten, I guess, people's interest in and what rating system you may choose to use as a council um, because of where there may be, where those valuations may um, increase. It doesn't always increase evenly right across the district, for instance, and so some people stand to maybe be better off or worse off, and, and that's, again, a reflection of uh, what's shown in those percentage increases on the side, on the side there um, will often be um, as a result of how we do set up the rating, the rating system. David, sorry, an obvious question is, um, I don't know the answer, but the obvious question is um, the revaluations on the properties for the current market valuations, as we know, around the country are, are crashing. Does, does, so does QV at any time do a, a reval any, other than the three years or so they do it by practice because of that, or is it? I think I know the answer, but it's important. I'll let Jacinta jump in there and, and add anything more that you want to think is helpful. Sure, no, from a policy perspective, we have a choice. If we, if, if the council table chooses to value on a different cycle than the three yearly valuation, they can. Um, but QV won't typically value on an interim period unless the council chooses or asks it to. So, in terms of valuation this time, we are going, for example, on the 14th to, um, to Quota Values offices where, where the valuer general will be, re will be reviewing the protocol and the approach with which QV have, been, have approached this valuation and make sure there'll be a lot of scrutiny around it this year, particularly because of all the changes that are happening in the market. Yeah. How, how current is that QV information then? Is it, is it, you know, last month or is it six months ago or is it? So they've literally just finished all the valuations in the last, um, we got the initial first report in the last couple of days. So they've literally just finished and now they're at the stage of being audited themselves by the Valuer General before they then discuss it with us in more detail. Yeah.
So this is a, a breakdown for a um, property with a land value of 180,000 and a capital value of 400,000 um, and how uh, rates are divided up. We, you might have seen these in um, council website and also in the, the papers that we share this um, as a way of explaining what people's rates are spent on and so um, proportions will be different for um, different values. Right. Now, um, moving into the long-term plan amendment, did anybody have any general questions um, about any long-term plans or annual plan questions before we do move on? Yeah, just sort of that big question, I, and it's obviously not for today, but we've opted to do the 20-year where the minimum requirement is the 10-year, and the question's been raised as to the value of trying to project out 20 years. So I don't know when is appropriate for that discussion, but I think it's an important one to have. Yeah, so to, to pick up on that, so it was 2018 was the first time this council did a 20-year long-term plan. Uh, there have been a few other councils in the country do it. Kapiti had typically done a 20-year one. Um, in the past, we'd always done the 10-year the version. Part of the, the reasoning at the time was recognising that the district was experiencing growth and what was, I guess, became evident is you're required to do a 30 year infrastructure strategy. So you get this picture out 30 years for your infrastructure, but your long term plan basically just shows a 10 year picture. And I guess there was a little bit of a concern that maybe there could be quite a bit when we sort of mapped and modelled it at that stage that would be sitting in the 11, 11 plus years and maybe not having visibility of that or the community not having visibility of that. Um, might not be helpful. And so at that point in time, because of the growth and wanted to, I guess, try and get a good understanding of it, the decision was made to do a 20-year long-term plan. So we did that in 2018, did it again in 2021. Um, it was interesting to see a few more councils um, went down that route as well, did longer plans as well. Um, but that is something which as we approach the next long-term plan, I think that's a question which this table should consider. 10 years is the minimum. And obviously we've done 20. Uh, there's been some councils I think went a step further. We've done 30, I think, to, to, court, to be consistent with the infrastructure strategy. Um, but obviously it's an option that sits there and, and you need to be satisfied that it does actually serve a, a purpose or that one, what is the best option for the, for the council. So we're not necessarily locked and loaded saying it's a, just a continuation of 20 years when we do the next long-term plan. It's something which this table can um, obviously have a discussion about and decide on. Um, that would be, I don't think it changes too much in terms of the from a project plan point of view, the steps are still largely the same, but I would anticipate that sort of in the um, probably March-ish next year we'd want to, I guess, get that steer from the council in terms of what is it that we're actually planning to, to do in terms of setting up that work program for the, the LTP proper. Yeah, to pick it up on the Davids before it's my concerns about the 20 year one from time to time on, on, a, on a few on a few points but I think when we do that we're really good to have the, the pros and cons of, of what are the pros and cons of a 20 year what are the pros and cons of a 10 year just so we can get a real good picture um, on, on, on what are the best what is the best approach for us you know because I, I know what we picked up on the 20 years support at the time but there's been a few things that popped out of me have, have been a concern but probably they can be fixed anyway but yeah just be good to look at that Jacinta's just got a comment as well. Just one note, just from understanding councils, some of the councils across New Zealand and some of the reasons why they've chosen the 20 years has been from a borrowing's perspective predominantly, where council has had to increase significantly in the short term for growth or for other reasons. That 20 or 30 year view gives the community a chance to understand that the borrowings are planned to come down and that it's not an escalating view. So that, for a couple of councils, has been one of the key reasons why they've moved to a longer term. Um, going back to those assumptions that we're doing, I mean, with the amendment, we're probably cherry-picking some of those assumptions and spending more time on some than others. I suppose the critical one that might impact more than anything is the... Um, the growth one in terms of do we still stick 
and I think it's probably important for the, the table to understand that 95th percentile and the impacts that that has on any long-term plan. Do we stick with it? You know, what are the influential sort of data that is impacting as to why we uh, we chose that 95th percentile? Um, because it does have some considerable, and I don't know whether it's a topic for the amendment or a bigger topic for 2024. Um, but you'll have some. Just, just to quickly find this, um, obviously, more is the, the LTP proper, but it is, we are commissioning sort of updated work in that space and I think if we had seen something which is telling us a very different story at this point then we'd bring it to council. Um, one of the things you'd, we do have to be careful with with some of those an LTP amendment where I guess trying to keep the scope here, um, if we start to some of those forecasting assumptions um, obviously filter out right across the, right across the plan and there'll be some in populations probably one of those that if we were to make a change there, then it probably does broaden the scope of the plan because of just how wide-reaching it, it is within the plan. Justin, I think I saw your light. Um, morning, everyone. Tātahi um, meana ki tō tātou nei atua, but tūru meana ki tō tātou nei rangatira kua tākutu i te ata nei, te wairi kaki i rungi te marae o Rokoa. Huri moe mai rā, Moe mai rā, moe mai rā, te rana te rā. Um, uh, huri noa ki tō tātou nei whare. Um, look, I just wanted to have a couple of comments um, in regards to both the blueprint and the LTP and being very new and trying to understand how the documents work. Um, but what I was just going to comment was um, around the blueprint itself, I'm interested to know how that consultation took place and where we fitted into that consultation space. I'm interested to know um, how how we were embedded as Māori in that thinking around the blueprint, which is the guideline to the LTP, which is going to give outcomes. Mm. The other comment I wanted to make was, whatever we do in that space, the two words that come to my mind is unlock and not limit, and that's that future potential um, for iwi and Māori in the district. Um, so I know I'm just probably raising quite high things, but but I'm trying to seek assurance to know that we anything council are doing are not going to limit the ability for for Māori to activate in the in the district. Um, the other one was around wording. Um, we keep going back to these documents. Every document I read through, it talks about iwi partnership and engagement. But, but I want to emphasise on the wording because when you talk about Māori engagement we keep using the words support. But when we talk about other things that council are dealing with, we talk about develop, create, implement. And so there's a different word in here which gives different outcomes and different um, weight to what you what you put on it. So that's all I'm doing is just providing comment at this stage <laughs> that I that I as I've read through documents, I, I'm feeling there's um, some restraint perhaps around what Māori engagement should and could look like. Kia ora. So just to I made a note of those questions around the blueprint and when we do the detailed workshop on that, we'll address and, and go into some, some detail there. And I think this is you know, going to be a really valuable thing that you'll help us with, um, the, the second part being the, the wording and things like that. Um, yeah, we might not have always got it right in the past, but there's a real opportunity going forward, and this is going to be, be helpful to have. Um, so for your eyes, picking up those things, if we're not picking them up, uh, there is a conversation or some slides soon where we start to talk about EU engagement as part of the LTP amendment, and then again, that'll be interesting to, um, to have that conversation there, because at the moment, that's a reflection of, I guess, feedback from the previous council, and, and we're obviously just now socialising that with this council and, and testing is that still where this council goes so an opportunity there as well to feed into that. Okay, 
Thanks. Thank you. So now we'll turn from uh, general processes uh, to the long-term plan amendments that we've started working on. So um, we're getting slightly more detailed with our planning cycle. So where this fits, so we're looking ahead to year three. Uh, normally, we would just uh, do an annual plan, but this year we need to complete a long-term plan amendment as well. And as David has mentioned earlier, we are amending part of the LTP. And uh, if you keep this picture in mind, it is that it is a small block rather than the, the longer block. Um, and just noting on our slide here, the um, full LTP dates um, will be determined by yourselves. Um, so, uh, we move into the technical part about long-term plans. So that can be done at any point in the local authority planning cycle. And as just mentioned, it amends only part of it. Why do we need to do an amendment? So we need to make changes to the longer term budget now to ensure that we can continue to provide the key services our community relies on, doing this with the impacts on our community front and centre, and we're making additional changes to ensure that the spread of rates is fairer. So what we found is that over the last few years, the district's been growing fast, and that means that our infrastructure is reaching capacity sooner than anticipated. Key changes that are needed to the LTP, which will be um, talked about in more detail, um, are adding a Levin water treatment plant, starting wastewater upgrades in Levin because it's nearing capacity, and greater investment for stormwater improvements across the district to deal with our flooding issues. So these need to be represented in the current long-term plan so that they are phased and funded so that work can be started. Another part of it is looking at affordability. Um, affordability of rates for our community has been known as an issue for a long time. And with the cost of living crisis um, building on top of that is particularly front of mind. Um, and so that's why we're looking at can our rates be our rate spread be made fairer. And uh, we've got the live in landfill there as an asterisk, and that um, depends on the decisions that um, this table will make later. So looking the scope, we have key water uh, projects uh, becoming more resilient being able to uh, respond to or avoid flooding. Um, and also, uh, budgets need to change because costs have increased significantly more than expected. So this builds on what we were finding in the annual plan. But what we've found is that since 2021, construction costs have doubled, the price of fuel has increased 70%. And unfortunately, that means our original budgets won't pay for previously scheduled work. Now, while we're talking about water projects, it's important to note that this is separate to the government's Three Waters reform. This is about council being able to get critical work planned into our pipeline of work and get it underway. So the impacts of the Three Waters reform on our long-term plan are expected to be taken into account in the next full LTP. So the finance Moving down to the next bullet point, the financial strategy and revenue financing policy, two key parts of the long-term plan. And this is where our approach to rates and how we set our fees and charges are set out. So we're reviewing the revenue and financing policy to consider the equity, the affordability of our rates distribution. And we're also taking a look at some of our fees and looking at the public-private split. So what that means is about who benefits and who should pay. The public benefit being about how much the community benefits and how much should be um, paid for generally, for example, through rates. And how much is a private benefit? So how much does the individual benefit and how much should be charged through a fee? or an individual charge. 
like in the, the length that was just noted. Oh. Um, so it's been mentioned uh, that of those fees, we might only look at a few this time instead of the whole lot. And at what point do we determine those or is, is it going to be suggested which ones we cover off uh, during the amendment? So what we intend to do as part of the workshops when we work you through the results and they'll be the 7th, the 14th, and the 7th, 14th, 21st of December is we'll come to you as part of discussing each activity and how it's what the budgets are planned to be and as part of each activity let you understand the policy target that was set and whether we're currently compliant with that. Um, at this stage my, my sense is if we're not compliant there will be work done and options discussed with you but you will also have the option if we are still compliant to, to indicate to us at that point that you would still like to do a, a review of that activity area. So you'll see whether they're currently compliant and regardless of that, you'll have the choice or the indication to signal there whether you want to change anything. So um, recollection, I think there's two or three activities that were, out, well, not compliant. Um, and then the same goes for the zero based budgeting. You're only looking at one area, not the whole lot. Um, my last question around that would be, um, you know, our capex woes, and we've obviously adjusted for the current year to. But will we be doing that for this for that twenty three twenty four year? Even though we're not going to look right across. Yeah, so you're going to receive a series of briefing uh, workshops between um, now and Christmas, particularly in the um, in the three waters space, for instance. Um, so this here is probably trying to outline the scope. Um, Realise, well, I guess, rest assured, there's some some very detailed workshops to come. We're diving into those activities and and particularly the capex program and things will be part of that. Um, just while I've got my mic on, um, for new elected members, uh, we're talking fees and charges. There's probably two types within the organisation, within council. So there's some that we have to consult on. So we, we set on an end where you have to go through a consultation process. So those are typically the resource management or planning fees and then the food health fees. So those are ones where we have to go through a public consultation process on for making changes. Um, and then obviously that may lead to submissions and then council making a decision on those. Other fees, like maybe what we choose to charge for um, people using the pool or something like that, or parking, that's basically a decision which sits with council. It uh, doesn't need to go through that um, specific consultation process to, to do. Thank you. So where do we need to get to? So at the end of this, uh, we would like to have it that the community understands the purpose of the amendment and that they feel involved and heard throughout the development and throughout the process. Council needs to have an achievable plan to deliver the key water projects that are needed. For our rates, fees and charges to be seen as fair and equitable and a decision on the future of the landfill um, is made before the resource consent lapses. Now we um, have done a, a bit of work on this previously and had some discussions with the previous council um, about the outcomes sought and the ways of us um, as staff in providing information and working with elected members. Um, so I'd like to share those and then seek your feedback on whether there is anything additional that you would like us to include. Um, to have noted. So the outcomes that we're seeking is to ensure that the Promise Programme delivers on those community outcomes that were agreed in the 2021 LTP, to adopt a programme that we can be confident we deliver, to tell the growth story and to show the impacts clearly in a revised infrastructure strategy, and to ensure that the key water projects are planned and budgeted for at the right time to provide the required level of service for the community through a good quality activity management plan for the three waters. Just to add on to the communication and decision-making approach. 
So uh, cue of frequent communication. Um, this is a busy time. There are tight time frames. So uh, we will always let you know what the time frames are so that you know what is coming when and so that you know when um, you'll be receiving information, how much you need to be in involved and so that you can be heard and involved. We will be presenting a realistic and affordable budget uh, from the beginning, providing a greater level of detail on finances so it's clear how much money is going towards each project and unnecessary spending can be identified and that we provide clear and timely direction to keep to tight time frames. So I'd just like to pause here and ask whether there's anything that our new council would like to add or discuss about the outcomes and how information is presented. That's all right. If you have any additional ideas, uh, we are always here to just let us know. So we'll move on to um, issues and risks that we've identified so we're heading towards having this adopted by the 30th of June, and we've identified three key risks within this uh, tight, this pressured time frame. So the first is trying to include too much in this amendment. So we're this, that little box sitting above the annual plan, and what we're doing is being very clear about the scope, so that it is uh, largely key water projects, um, the revenue and financing review with the asterisks around the landfill. What we have found is that with those key performance measures, that we will be reviewing some of them, the critical ones within this long-term plan amendment process, but so um, time allows and we can do a good job of it, we'll be looking at all of them in the full long-term plan. So keeping that scope quite tight, um, we mentioned that, oh, I beg your pardon, about that and, and needing to obviously stay quite narrow and focused, um, how we, you know, the, the things we decide to do in that frame, how that might, you know, the implications of how it flows on to those other years or not, depending on what we decide. Do we get a picture of that as well, or, or we're just not looking over there? Yeah, so as part of the amendment, it does obviously adjust. Uh, it's not just one sort of year that it adjusts, it adjusts the knock-on effects as well. So yes, we all make some decisions or include some things in the LTP amendment, and you amend that part right through for the, the rest of that. Um, activity or whatever project is for the life of the LTP. So it does it does look at those knock-on effects. Not answer the question? I just, um, I'm just thinking of your picture, earlier picture of the three slots and then there was no other boxes. I just thought it comes off. I, you could have grayed that out and said we'd look at that, but it's, this is the focus. <laughs> That's a good point, thank you. Um, that was just uh, because the cycle then starts again, so I thought we'd just start fresh. Okay, um, so the second risk that we've um, identified is those uh, two audit periods that we need. Uh, the timeframes are set for us, and so what we need to do is make sure that we keep our work on track um, to make sure that we can meet them. And, um, and at the moment, we're working with Audit New Zealand to have our timeframes confirmed. So the third issue, um, there's a lot of talk about three waters um, and there's a, a potential for confusion uh, with our work on our key water projects with the, the wider three waters reform. So um, we can be looking at making sure that our messaging is really clear to distinguish what we are doing and why we are doing it. But one way that we can also do it is when we're doing that messaging, if we talk about key water projects, it starts us off just using different terminology and hopefully just doesn't have that immediate link to Three Waters Reform. So, yes, keeping those separate will be really important. So, so can, I, can I just clarify or drill into that? 
So essentially for the three waters component of the LTP amendment, our messaging is that the population growth is that has been experienced and that we are expecting to experience is higher than the forecasting assumptions that were in the LTP, or are we saying we didn't get it right in the previous LTP, or is it a bit of a both? With some specific slides that basically say there's a range of things which have contributed to, to this. Um, some of it's a, an enhanced understanding, some of it's, I guess, understanding the the um, the weather, the more significant weather events that we're having. There's a range of things that are contributing, uh, but I think if you can, be patient. And, and when we get the, keep that question, because if the slides that you see uh, later today don't answer that, then, then obviously we want to make sure you do have the answer. But from what I've seen, they, they are going to set out and give that wider context rather than us just sort of hit a couple of headlines now. Yeah, I think I just had the same comment as well. It seems a bit confusing on on whether it's needed now or whether we're actually doing something for three waters later. And if we're finding it confusing, the community is going to find it confusing. The, the other component is, is that there is a lot of discussion around um, already funding coming from Three Waters. Um, and it seems sensible that why isn't that funding from Three Waters then coming in to offset some of the you know, forecasts and projections needed for the VIN now? Probably to try and answer the first part of that, I would say, if I was to summarise, I'd be saying what we'll be showing through the long-term plan amendment is, is what we think is good planning. So. Reform, I guess, getting us to think in a particular way and the requesting certain information and getting us to... But what we uh, will be presenting to you is what we believe is good planning in terms of what the actual district, what the district actually needs uh, based on the circumstances that we're, we're faced with now and, and going forward. Moving from issues and risks to opportunities, and within this long-term plan amendment, there are opportunities to do things differently uh, to improve the, the process uh, for iwi and hapu and for the wider horofunua community. Uh, looking at changing the way that we work to uh, recognise and improve partnership with iwi and hapu, to increase the range of submitters and overall to reduce the barriers to interacting with council. It can be uh, quite daunting coming into uh, a room and sitting at the table to present. So we're looking at, you know, can we go out and hear submissions um, and just make it easier for people to talk to us um, and to um, talk to um, the group of elected members as well. What we're doing here is uh, we're trying a few things um, with the smaller scope of the long-term plan amendment um, and as a warm-up for the full LTP so that uh, we'd look at what are the good ideas, what works, uh, what could we tweak or amend or what doesn't work and should we not do again. So looking at Iwi Hapu engagement, um, what good could look like is a process that protects, maintains and enhances cultural values and manner of parties throughout the process. Uh, working with some values including kaitiaki, whakapapa, partnership, inclusivity, equity, trust and ensuring that what we do is consistent with tikanga. There are several reasons for this. Um, our partner, a treaty partner, um, partnerships with Mana Whenua is one of um, the Council's five key outcomes. Our relationships are growing and evolving. Um, central government is moving processes along and Council has a strong desire to improve relationships as well. And now we also have our two Māori ward councillors which possibly presents us with different opportunities as well. So we've been doing some early thinking as a team uh, and with our cultural outcomes team uh, about possibilities of how we can uh, change what we're doing. And so coming from this direction, instead of starting with how, um, 
we consider the, the why and the intention of our engagement. So to provide just a little bit of background there, one of the things that has occurred in the past was the, the feedback and the message we got from our EWI partners um, in talking to them about this was that sense of not wanting just to be seen as a, another stakeholder or just a part of the community. So typically we as a council would notify the, adopt the consultation document and supporting information, open up the submission period, and we would have sat there expecting if we had an interest for them to make a submission and to go through the, the standard or traditional channels. What we uh, came to understand through that conversation of actually, you know, we don't want to be treated like a, a just a stakeholder and having to go through that process was looking at, well, could we do that differently? And so in previous processes, what we've done is enabled, um, for instance, uh, a hui, have a hui around the, the long-term plan or the annual plan, talk about that, uh, take notes from that, and then that process there, rather than having to be written in a submission form, our officers have captured that and presented that to elected members as part of the deliberations process. So you've had that feedback to be considered um, at the table when you've, you've made that decision. So that's just one example, I guess, where we've sort of in the past tried to break the mould and tried to look at something a bit different, which does reflect the relationship that we have with our, our EU partners. But certainly open to um, any thoughts. Again, this is some of the stuff that has been um, discussed with the previous council and, and as we start to explore in the space keen to test whether that's still a reflection of the, the current council or if there's anything different that you might want to see or ideas that you might have. Uh, just me. <laughs> um, no, look, I think it's um, it, it's a good starting point and I think as, as the team goes through um, there's more clarity around around that space. Um, one of the things I think is missing off there that could be quite strategic is that spatial planning um, that's been talked about and, and that will help council and understand the lay of the land a lot better. So, kia ora. Okay, thank you. We'll add that in. So, um, we've looked at some Possibilities for improving engagement and consultation opportunities. Um, there's recognised cultural practices. I want it to be inclusive, flexible, and about growing trust with iwi hapu and with our wider community. So looking at the Local Government Act, it doesn't actually require submissions to be made in writing. Um, there's just the requirement that the opportunity is provided for people to have their views on a decision or matter considered by council and present those views in a manner and format that's appropriate to the preferences and needs of those persons. So that means that we've got an opportunity uh, to investigate whether we can take the hearings process out to our community, to marae, to schools, libraries, other places, and submissions could be recorded by a note taker or audio and video. Um, this would give um, people who prefer to, to talk rather than to write um, an easier and more preferable option for having themselves heard. It isn't instead of a, a written submission, so that people could still do that and then speak to their submission, but it's broadening out the opportunities for that. Also looking at providing a friend of the submitter service uh, to provide advice on the process and ways to make a submission. So um, a lot of people don't know how council works and how to get in there. So if we can make it easy and provide a person who can help them through that, just answer any questions that they've got, um, that could be a useful step. Um, looking at whether there's an opportunity for people to send in audio or video submissions. And whether we, uh, or oh, I had a, a point twice, I thought it's so important. Um, so the benefit of this is it's for the, the whole community to mean that council can meet with people in their places. And it's more likely to encourage people that we don't normally hear from to come and share their views. Looking ahead with the future of the local government reform, talks about greater community involvement, Hora Whenua could potentially lead a transformation in community engagement and consultation. 
So we're still looking at the logistics of all of that and what is possible um, and whether we can do it for this long-term plan amendment or whether it's more realistic to try it for the long-term plan itself. Um, but we'll come back to you and discuss that with you later. I think great to have these ideas and initiatives and I think hopefully you pick up the teams open to exploring those. I think in the back of our mind we see it, there is a balance to be struck between it's, it still needs to work in practical terms and, and so we still want it to be a positive experience for the submitter as well or the community who want to be part of this, this process. So yes, if going to some remote place um, might sound like a good idea but if that's actually going to then sort of make it difficult for other parts of the community to sort of be part of that process or um, your experience as decision makers is compromised through that, then we, we need to, to weigh that up. For those who are not familiar with the traditional process, um, current or former elected members will regale with the stories of receiving sort of um, large folders of, of hard copy submissions and several hundred pages um, to potentially try read through in advance of, of people coming along and speaking or scrolling through obviously um, hundreds of pages on your on your tablets there uh, with the view being that in the past elected members have liked to have I guess had an idea of what a submitter is coming along to speaking speak to so they will have read the submission and then potentially prepared some questions to maybe ask that submitter once they've, they've spoken to so some of these things take us a, a little bit further away from that and that's you know someone if we followed some of these options here, someone could be turning up. You might not know whether they'll talk about Foxton, Manukau or somewhere else. Um, and so your ability to maybe have pre-thought or pre-researched things might not be um, might not be there. But uh, like I said, has said, you know, we're quite open to looking at this. And in some ways, this opportunity through potentially the LTP amendment does give us a chance to maybe test and trial some things and, and then to see whether they work as well. So we're open, open to that. Uh, commentary views on audio and video formats being considered. What about virtual hui? Is that off the table? Or does it need to be face to face, or have we considered, or can we look at <coughs> virtual? <coughs> by by default, we have had to do some hearings virtually in the past, and the team actually did a really good job working with submitters um, ahead of time to prepare those who might not be as familiar with things. I feel we gave a really good level of support to, to people to be able to present that way. Uh, so it does sit there as, a, as an option and um, an option does exist in terms of potentially you know, having a hybrid mix of in-person hearings or those that, that might be done remotely and things. And when we think about barriers to participation, uh, potentially getting here or getting here within a certain time window and things can be, can be a challenge for some. So that does open up that opportunity. Um, so my view is that we do need to uh, make it a heck of a lot easier for people to submit. Um, I don't think the process is very um, user-friendly at all, what we've been doing in the past. Um, and so I'm keen to explore a few different avenues in terms of getting out to the community and making sure that we are talking to them. Uh, a lot of them will be scared of the submission process itself. They don't want to put things in writing. Uh, they don't want to appear. Uh, but they may well be open to a conversation uh, with us um, as a group. So I'm keen to explore um, turning up to the Shannon Library or the Tauho or the Rise or the Manukau Hawks or wherever, taking one or two of us um, together and listening to a group of people who actually have a conversation rather than even individuals, identifying 6, 10, 15 people that we know have always contributed to um, hearings in the, or submissions in the past, uh, but may be willing to actually sit down together and have a conversation so that we get a better idea of what they actually want for their communities and things like that. We've also taken the opportunity before to talk to groups like Federated Farmers, Great Power, um, those sorts of groups obviously want to uh, have some pre-engagement as well rather than uh, just turn up for a submission hearing. Uh, so, yeah, there's different ways that we can try and do things. Um, um, and I'm, whether the amendment is the time to do that or we, um, we start for the 2024 um, LTP 
you know, that, again, we just need to think about that. But I'm sure there are will be opportunities this time round to do some of that work as well. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with all of those points, uh, Bernie. And, yeah, the submission part is, is my favourite of the, the whole process, just hearing from, um, you know, strangers. I mean, most of them are, you never come across and you never really hear from um, their views and they know their place better than you. I mean, I know Levin pretty well and parts of Foxton, but... Yeah, you really do hear um, about their place in more detail. And, and the wider we can go, the better. And, and maybe that point about save the the big reach for um, the full LTP. But, yeah, let's do something this round. I just wonder, my question is, that friend of the submitter, I've raised this before, um, can, how can you, or will you, um, be able to... Um, ensure that the friend is not is like apolitical has no bias and doesn't shape that individual's um submission in, in their way that it's pure as much as possible um that's all i figured yeah yeah look it ends up being a person we obviously pay to, to deliver that service and so it becomes part of the terms of reference with that, that person um, but it's also about I guess putting some parameters around what they actually do when they're, they're helping people so don't see them necessarily um, you know, I'll, I'll say drafting in, in the sense of you know giving the, the person the words to write but uh, what they would do is sort of say look for your you know make sure you cover off what it is that you're asking for or what is it that you're actually opposing and, and make sure that people feel their submission has a chance of, of some cut through in the sense of um, being on a on a relevant topic, being um, being clear about what it's what it's covering and things like that. So being able to give some sort of steer as to how to actually participate um, could hopefully help some people who might have otherwise been scared off when they see a form and think, oh, I don't know how to write in council speak or <laughs> wouldn't know where to start in terms of writing my thoughts down. This person can sort of give them some guidance to make sure they're filling out the right parts and, and obviously cover up those key things which are important for you as decision makers to, to understand. Look, just a quick comment from me, and I think Bernie touched on it. One of the most productive forms of engagement in the past is where you bring together people who traditionally, or groups that traditionally have opposing views, sit them down together, understand first of all, what are the commonalities, what are the things you do agree on apart from the points of difference and really importantly what are the driving principles for you that you share and that sort of that that thing about understanding the commonalities uh, 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 is just as important as understanding the differences I think so just wanted to speak in favour of that initiative. Just a quick note on that one um, the intention is hopefully with the rates review that we'll be able to do something of that nature because I think there are definitely, in, from that perspective that you've discussed there, it's a, it's a good opportunity for each of the different views to have a chance to get their points across and, and share the information. So we'll try to do that, definitely. And that leads us nicely into uh, what's happening when. So these are some of the uh, key milestones throughout the process of formulating uh, the long-term plan amendment. And so I'll run through them um, also to give you an idea of how much um, you will need to be involved at different uh, stages of these parts. Um, so as we continue with these uh, series of workshops, we're also looking to do some early engagement uh, with the community to share that uh, we are doing a long-term plan amendment and about what is being considered and to look at when we can start some of these early conversations. Now, um, after the series of workshops, um, we will be uh, preparing the consultation document and supporting information. Um, we will have that uh, by the end of January, start of February. Um, that will be ready for you, but also ready for audit. 
Um, so once it's with audit, uh, slightly less work for us, um, but that is a key driver of this short, intense sprint to Christmas so that we um, can share all of this information with you, get the steer from you, and then prepare that information. So um, this is one of the dates that may be adjusted and depends on Audit New Zealand's capacity, the risk that we highlighted earlier. Just to make it clear, one slight links with the audit, basically that's sort of the version. Um, so when we're in that audit phase, it's not a phase where we're still coming back to you seeking sort of direction or, or seeking guidance on things at that point. We need that in advance of that period because then we need to prepare all that together, put that, package that up so that audit have a set of documents that they can, can audit. So the sprint, is, as Carrie talks about, is basically between now and, and sort of the early part of um, well, yeah, January, very early February because it, by, we basically need to have that documentation ready for the auditors. There will be some other work that they're doing. If we miss our window, then it's a potentially a challenge to um, continue to hit the rest of the, the timeframes, basically. So see yourselves as having a, a hump at the moment um, in terms of what you need to be across and understand. During the audit process, basically, you, you don't have a whole lot during that, that period. And then as Carol starts to talk about, your, your engagement picks up again. Yes, and one of those um, areas uh, could be the submission period. That's the formal consultation period. So following on from the discussion that was just being had, we'd like to um, come back to you at a future uh, workshop and to talk more about how much and how you'd like to be involved as well. Um, so the submission period we've got marked in for March and April. Now, then... Uh, between the formal consultation period and hearings, this will be that very busy time for you. Um, David talked about the stack of uh, submissions to read. Um, so we'll be collating all of those and presenting them to you, uh, whether it's in, in audio, video or written format, uh, depending what's decided, um, so that you're able to get across those before the hearings. Given the topics that are in or potentially in uh, with the landfill, um, key water projects and rates affordability. We're picking that there've been quite a lot of submissions, that these are all issues individually which um, generate a lot of interest. So um, looking at how we manage that and get that to you. For that reason, um, expecting a higher volume, uh, we've also got three dates for hearings marked in at the moment, the 9th, 10th and 11th of May. After that, I just it's one of those things until you know how many submissions you've got, you don't quite know how long you'll need for hearings and at what time of day we might start and what time of night we might finish. With LTP and annual plan, um, we are able to restrict or provide a set amount of time for, for submitters to speak to, so typically we give them. 10 minutes and give them an option of whether they use that whole 10 minutes and then don't allow any time for questions. Um, our advice is to obviously allow some time for questions. If there's a group presenting in the past, we've allowed them a slightly longer amount of time. Um, but that's been very necessary to get through, um, obviously, the, the number of submitters. Obviously, not everyone who makes a submission comes along and speaks. Um, and you still have to consider both the, the submissions that you have heard from as well as those that have provided submissions in other forms and so at those hearings it is basically a, a, you know, you're absorbing what they are having to say sometimes they'll read their submission we try to discourage if it's just a repeat of what they've already provided but often they'll be adding extra information and, and speaking to that and then it's your chance to ask them questions officers are here in the room listening and taking um, note of what's said as well because what then happens is for the the next bit deliberations is where you get the reports where officers have considered the submissions and provided a, a recommendation. That's where you start to, to make your decisions. Um, again, the amount of time required for deliberations um, is often dictated by the, the number of submissions as well. And so we do have to signal it, but just appreciate as we get closer to the time, then we'll start to be able to be more definite around what that looks like for you. But for those of you who are new, potentially talk to someone who's been on one of those processes before and they'll give you a bit of a sense of what that sort of lead up, you know, what sort of time you might need to allow to 
prepare yourself for hearings and what that looks like for a, a couple of days sitting in here having people just sort of cycle through and giving you a, a download. regards to the video, you know, people can make a video, submit that. Um, would you or could you suggest some guidelines and um, around timing and like otherwise we could get 30 minutes from that person and an hour over there, I just don't, that, but you know, a whole lot of 10 minute videos would be manageable. Um, and it's not to cut them off, it's just make it clear, get your points across, you know, show whatever it is if that's a bit of footage, but don't go on because we can't watch it all, yeah. <laughs> that would be really important, having kind of those parameters and that guidance. Mm. You have to do this, yeah. Mm. Yeah, yes, that's great. Um, so you mentioned deliberations um, and that um, ahead of uh, elected members um, discussing and debating the issues and options. Um, as officers and staff, we will provide you an analysis of the all of the submissions um, to give you that bigger picture um, and also to have that bigger picture because as David mentioned, not everybody comes and speaks in support of their submission. So moving into that in early June, then we have that final audit um, of the final draft of the LTP document that then comes back to you uh, to for adoption um, and then uh, we have got the week between adoption and setting rates so that we can have as many ratepayers included in our um, pie splitting so yeah <laughs> that's why we're doing that and to show you this in a a graphic form where we are at the moment is coming towards the um, the end of this first purple block the gap in between that and draft long-term plan amendment that's Christmas and so that's um, the sprint there um, we haven't done this to proportion because the next bit draft long-term plan amendment and consultation document that little person there, um, just to the right of it, is basically at the start of February. So that's um, another busy part, but that's a busy internal staff part. And then we'll come back to you. Um, and then we step this through. This is a, a graphic that we'd like to use with the public as well to take them on the journey. Um, and as we as staff work through this, we're moving ourselves along the, the path. Um, and I just wondered if uh, maybe only you'd like to talk about um, time frames or anything there. <laughs> yeah. um, look, there's no doubt that between now and Christmas, um, it's going to feel like you're going to be receiving a lots of information and talking about lots of things. But as you can see from that, you know, we don't have a lot of time. It's governed a lot by... Uh, what we have to do in terms of audit and consultation periods and hearings and everything like that. So a lot of the introductory work that we are doing now uh, has to be completed. So it will feel like you're being pressured. It will feel like um, that you think you haven't got enough time uh, to actually make some critical decisions. But the reality is, is that we have to, as a team, um, make those critical decisions um, almost before Christmas uh, and give these guys the guidance and the direction uh, that we want to inform those consultation documents and, and, the, uh, and the plan um, so they can go to um, audit. And some of the risks, obviously, if we don't do that, means that some of the consultation periods or the hearing periods or whatever starts to become too uh, time pressured down, further down the track. So the more uh, direction and planning that we can do at the moment uh, in this period, what, today's the 9th of February, we've got, uh, 9th of November, sorry, uh, we've got till, you know, that middle of um, December to be able to make sure that we do do that. Um, so just a heads up, 
that you're going to be given um, lots of workshops and lots of information. But at the end of it, there's got to be a time where we're going to have to make some critical decisions in terms of what goes in there. And we will try to make that easier for you. We will try to make it so that when you are turning up to a workshop, uh, you know what the purpose of that workshop is. You have had, hopefully, some opportunity to do some pre-reading to that workshop uh, and that you will know what the direction is uh, that we are looking for or the outcomes of that workshop. So um, there will be no, as we said last week, surprises in terms of what is in front of us at that stage. Um, we will try to make it as easy as possible. What I would also like to encourage is that if you feel that it is becoming overwhelming or you're not sure of things, don't come to a workshop and then feel that you can't contribute. You need to be able to be coming here feeling that you can contribute. So if that means we have informal um, get-togethers uh, for whoever wants them just to uh, explain processes or understand more information and whether that was with ourselves or getting one or two of the team with us to guide us a little bit more. Uh, the more we can do that before we actually get to the workshop, because they're public, because they're open, because they're transparent, we, um, a lot of those questions hopefully um, might have been able to be solved or answered before we actually get to them. Um, so, yeah, if you've got any issues around that time frame and what the pressure that it's going to cause, you know, please sing out. Uh, as I said, we'll try and get it as um, comfortable as possible. But, yeah, it won't be easy, uh, but especially with so many newbies and understanding things. And I hope already you get a scale of what, what is in, in terms of that. And we obviously talked about that last week and, and as well. But the expectations on both sides, you know, to try and keep it as open, as transparent as possible is, is very top of mind as well. All right. Um, my only comment um, was actually um, just around, you know, we talk about risks and, and red flags and things, and I think what would be useful, um, especially for new counsellors, is to understand what are the what are some of the um, things that are consistent around submitters in terms of whether that's negative or positive. So, you know, on those that have never been through an LTP, are there any 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 um, issues that keep arising? Um, are there a particular type of submitter that we're expected to um, be confronted by? Um, and if it's a if it's a submitter that's always submitting to the same thing, what what's what's the point, or what are we doing to work with that submitter um, to try and give them clarity to be able to move forward? Because I'm sure people don't want to sit here talking about the same thing twelve years as an example. So that's just for me. Is there anything that we can look at as councillors to understand that a little bit more and what we might expect to see? Kia ora. Thank you. We'll look at that. Um, and finally, um, to give you the next steps, so um, more detail about the, the workshops about in our short sprint up to Christmas. So uh, the second workshop, uh, Jacinta will be talking to you about the rates for review uh, in, on the 23rd of November. Following that, um, she'll be leading a discussion, a workshop about the infrastructure and financial strategies on the 7th of December. 14th of December, we have workshop four about uh, key water projects, uh, the AMP and the water budget. Uh, also on the same day, we've got the bigger picture, the overall budget, the revenue and financing policy, which brings in um, the rates and fees and charges, and also about the process in the new year. So um, that's, oh, David. Look, that's been uh, the foundation, I guess, uh, today, conscious that for some, been around the table quite a bit, and for LTP and your plan processes for others, probably not had to get too close to them in the past. So that was the starting point today. Hopefully you've got a bit of an understanding between a, an LTP proper and annual plan and also now LTP amendment. Also a feel for 
I guess, the way we're trying to approach it and some of the ways that we're looking to engage and, and go through the, the decision-making process. Um, I did feel that with five elected members in the room have been through it before, whether there would be a good question I'd like to pose to you for maybe the benefit of the, the new ones is, what advice would those that have been through a process, the LTP process before, what, what advice would you provide to a new elected member? Or what did you perhaps, what were you surprised about when you went through your first LTP? And uh, I just feel that might be, a, to get an elected member perspective, might be helpful for the new elected members if there was anything that a previous elected member had on their mind. A lot of eyes are looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, it, it's been mentioned already, but two things. One is the the significant weight of the workload in terms of the submissions. And when we think about what we're looking at with the amendment and with the LTP proper, this community will engage. And it'll engage um, pretty mightily, I think. So it's about it's about pacing yourself, I think. Um, and for me, it's about just breaking it down into, into days in the week, hours committed to, jotting down initial thoughts, initial reactions. And the second leg for me is about absolutely keeping in touch with relevant officers, making sure in a timely way, any questions either about the process or about the content that you keep in touch with officers along the way. Don't so that would be two things. Oh, and, the, and the final thing, there is a third out of two, is um, the, the risk of predetermination. And that's something I no doubt we'll cover just in terms of good governance, but it's really important, particularly on those deeply emotional issues, um, to, to avoid predetermination, to really weigh, not just hear the evidence, but to weigh the evidence. What, what are the values that each of the submitters are bringing to the table and how do you weigh up those, those submissions? There's no doubt that um, the amendment will be quite a little different from what the actual LTP will be in 2024. The amendment is quite focused. It's quite, you know, we're, we're looking at three, possibly three pretty major topics. So the scope of that may not be as wide as what a normal long-term plan would be. Um, but I think what's critical is that in fact, if you want to influence what's in that long-term plan, you need to actually have your thoughts and vision and, and aspirations pretty much defined before we go to consultation. Because that's where the influence in terms of what's in that consultation do document um, comes out. So it's not, and later on the decision-making will be come, but if you've got your aspirations and things, now that may be not, a topic for this amendment, but certainly for the long-term plan in 2024, that's what you should be focusing on and thinking about some of the things that you want to achieve uh, this term uh, could be incorporated in that. In terms of the actual process, um, yeah, look, it, there's no doubt that there is pressure in terms of the submission period, the hearings, it becomes sometimes what you might consider laborious uh, and, and um, pretty hard work. Uh, but it's also really important in terms of trying to understand what the community are, um, are saying to us. Um, so it's a pretty critical um, part of the whole thing. Um, but we're here to help, that's all. Yeah, I think most of it's been said, and I think it's been said well, but yeah, time management, you know, just... Um, you know, these piles of submissions to browse through, you know, just, just, I made the first, um, I think in the, probably the first one, we did the first LTP of, of trying to do it all at once, and you just, you just got mind, mind numbed. Um, so just time management, and just do it piece by piece, and put some time away when uh, you can to, to have a good look at them. And you'll, re you'll recognise the similarities between the submissions, so you don't, you don't, don't read the, everything the same, everything that's the same, all the time, but if it just noted in your mind, of course, that that's, that's, that carries on a weight because a lot of people are saying it, you know. So, you quickly, I think, in time, you learn 
how to, how to put that out and, and, and manage that, that submission process well in your own mind and, and the time you're trying to devote to it. So um, use your time well, I think. And, and, and again, ask lots of questions from, of us or and officers, Nick and the team, um, because some stuff you'll get, you just can't get your head around it. You know? So there's no, there's no silly questions in this stuff. There's just none. So just don't hesitate to yell out um, at all. Don't be shy. Because it's really important. It's probably, it's probably the most important thing you do around this table is, is listen to the community and make decisions based on what's their way to that evidence. Yeah. I've just got a question, um, and it is based on the experience of previous LTPs. So um, whilst this is focused for us and we're going to do these three things and we're only going to ask these questions quite often, you, you know, the, you ask in the community, but they'll raise something else and, and they might make a video about something else or, or, you know, say something else that's not even kind of where we're looking. And um, understanding that, I guess my question for officers is, are you going to collate all those additional requests and say, oh, some of these will, or that, is that for us to determine? Or you, you say, oh, well, we'll move that over to the, the proper LTP or, I mean, if you want to discuss these, even though it's not on our radar, you can. Like, how, how are we going to manage that? <coughs> Look, a lot of it will di be dictated by what those, those requests might be. Um, as part of the LTP amendment, yes, we're looking at three, we'll say, for even say three parts of the current LTP, but we're also doing an annual plan as well. So if one of those requests was for something for next financial year, then, yep, it's on the table for this council to consider do we want to put budget and we'll move something to, to actually have that happen next year. If it was for something a bit more further out, um, then we'd, I think at this stage, officer advice would be that thing gets picked up and, and looked at as part of the LTP proper. And yes, we'd have a process where we'd certainly be keeping track of those and the feedback to the submitter if it is a submission that's been made would be around obviously explaining that but also making sure that they, um, if there was something they, else they needed to do to support that submission or something like that, that they was prepared ahead of the, the upcoming process and we signalled that for them. Uh, Any other final uh, questions for you? D David, can I just emphasise that um, like the power sits at the council table. So unless we give you advice that says, council, you can't make a decision on this because it triggers significance and you need to consult with the community, if through that long-term plan or annual plan process, community comes forward with staff and it doesn't trigger significance and doesn't require consultation, it's for you as elected members to give us that message that that's a discussion and a debate that you want to have. And the way that we pre present the reports should enable that for you to for you to lead out on that. Oh, don't need a press button. No. <laughs> Um, this is probably a silly question, but I'm assuming that at some stage we'll get some documentation we can take out to the community groups that we have to work with and talk to. It'd be nice to get some sort of documentation or some sort of heads up prior to the submission and consultation processes with the, with the public. Yeah, there's a bit of work that's uh, been talked about in terms of pre-engagement where we are wanting to socialise and, and the rates was one of those areas where we do think it's... Uh, going to be one of those topics where it's helpful to let people know it's coming and to also be able to talk to them. Um, we do have to be a little bit careful, particularly in the LTP space, around what we use uh, by way of consultation material. So the consultation document is something that gets audited and that's got to be our key piece of consultation material. So there is a, there are some, some caution there around just having a whole lot of other additional information because... Yeah, for, for very legislative, various legislative reasons, um, if someone had only seen the sort of the, the bit of paper and not the consultation document and things like that, it uh, brings into question the process. So, yes, we want to make you feel informed. We've got information you can share. Um, we'll be looking to do that. Um, but closer to that submission period time, it will be in the consultation document. And obviously the, the links that that might sort of refer to and things will be the, the key source of information for you to uh, have those conversations with you interest groups. David, sorry, just one thing that's um, 
on my mind was that in the previous term, some elected members expressed a preference around that for an annual plan or an LTP process that you'd start from the from the discussion around a funding envelope. So you'd say, this is where your appetite sits in terms of rate increase or uh, a budget envelope. And then obviously there would be, th that, that would give um, officers some indication of the envelope in which to present options or trade-offs, that kind of thing. Because we're not doing that here with the long-term plan amendment and also the annual plan, are we going to, uh, will we likely receive different options in terms of levels of an investment? So it's not just going to be one version, either you do this or you don't. Um, it's it's going to sort of, I guess, have graduated options or different layers depending on, because they're all going to have different implications. And, and, and because we're going to be looking at the, particularly the LTP amendment where you're looking at what, one or two activities potentially in isolation, it's going to be very challenging to make those trade-off decisions to say, well, yes, happy to um, prioritise and invest more in here, but something you've got to give over, over here. So we're, we're not going to be able to have that opportunity, I suspect. Just a quick comment on that. I think... Absolutely, you will have some conversation. You're, as part of the conversations around the financial strategy and the infrastructure strategy, you will absolutely have that chance to let us know where you think you sit in terms of um, parameters around borrowings, around rates, around our levels of capital spending. So that's absolutely a conversation that you can have as part of that process. As well, your, your, your question around options they will be coming to you particularly in relation to the three waters because there is such a significant change that's needed as part of the options that um, Daniel and his team are working on as part of the reform. There will there needs to be different options that are put forward because of the impact. So in terms of options, yes, absolutely, as part of the LTP, you will need to see options because we will be pushing up against borrowings limits and other items, rates as well in relation to insurance, interest, and other increases that have been signi significantly different than what we predicted during the LTP. So I think you'll definitely be seeing some of those. So can I just ask then, in the context of that timeline that you showed us up here before, where do you see that, that conversation happening in terms of that signal around comfort level appetite? Because that's just what I wanted to get in my head about where that so sort of sets in terms of the sequence of, of things. Cara, if you don't mind, just go yeah, back to that one. So at the uh, workshop three, you'll have an indication there in terms of from a strategic perspective, what are, what are our plans for investment? And then on the, on the 14th as well, you'll see the impact of some of those conversations and what they mean in terms of potential options. So starting at the, at the 7th and then further on the 14th. And I think probably what's important to note, Councillor Jennings, is that that will be quite an um, iterative process because on the 7th of December, you might give some guidance that says debt needs to sit at 150% of balance sheet, um, rates can't be more than 1% on top of CPI, and then we present you some AMPs associated with three waters that says, hey, we've got a problem here, guys. Um, you know, We're not going to be able to invest at the rate in which our asset management plans and the data is telling us we need to. Uh, and so that's when the options come in. The what's a high risk, medium risk, low risk option? And what does that mean in terms of how the infrastructure strategy and the financial strategy collide? Um, and that's why you know so many councils, because the legislation has written it like this, we have separate finance and infrastructure strategies. But actually, in a perfect world, your infrastructure and strategy and your financial strategy should really mirror each other and become one. Um, we're probably not quite there yet, but hopefully come 14th of December, you walk out of here being like, oh yeah, I can see how these two documents might actually talk to each other and um, yeah, ho hold hands to try carry the, the community conversation through.
I just pushed the button and I thought, oh, maybe I could ask that question or find the button. No, it's not now. Um, we've started a section 17 on the parks, and in terms of timing, will that back process be complete when we strike this, or no, it's ready for the next? Yeah, it will be. Um, so council will have accepted the report, adopted some recommendations, the impact of that, though, might not fall until the 2024 year. And so that's where I think some of the thinking is already kind of leaning to around that Section 17A review is how, to, how does this stuff line up with our long-term plan processes? Because obviously that particular contract doesn't line up to it. OK, we'll finish there. Thank you for your attention and time and uh, you now sort of know the team that's uh, behind the process so don't hesitate if there are things that you need to, to touch base with us on um, but you'll see a bit more of us in the coming um, coming weeks